Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of The Greatest Profession Podcast. Today on the podcast with me, I have Seth Williams. Seth Williams is a fella who I met at the Live Oak Bank externship, the same externship that I met Carrie Mead, who you may recognize from a couple episodes ago. And he was a little bit earlier in school than the rest of us. I think he had just finished up his first year, and but he, you know, it took a while or you know a couple of years between vet, um, undergrad and vet school. So, you know, he was a little bit closer to my age. I think that coming into coming back into the academic system after taking a period of time off, it's it's kind of two things. One, it's it's nice because you do have a different sort of perspective. I mean, you definitely approach uh, the education that you're getting in a different way. Um, but also it's daunting because you don't remember how to study. They're just, they're just throwing facts at you and you're just like, your, your hands are numb or something. You're just like, I can't catch the facts. Um, so it's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, so that's one of the things that we, uh, you know, bonded over and, and talked a lot about when we were in North Carolina together. Um, and then we continued talking about that. Um, after he, I guess after we parted ways, he actually started a podcast called Vet School Unleashed, dissecting the DBM. Um, he did, you know, I don't know, 50 some odd episodes of that while he was in vet school. Um, I was actually a guest on that podcast. We talked about test taking strategies, um, Navli prep, that type of thing. Cause I used to teach MCAT prep when I was in vet school. I taught um, MCAT prep for Kaplan and I'm like, Hey, I got, I got some ideas and opinions. So if you are interested in listening to more of Matt and Seth talk about education, um, there is more of it on the internet somewhere. And um, just, you know, wherever you get your podcast, dissecting the DBM, that's cool unleashed. And there we are. So yes, I mean, we've talked a lot about the education system. That's one of the things we actually almost wrote a book or we wrote like half a book um, about surviving vet school. So, you know, Please look to the Barnes and Noble nearest you uh, for soon, soon to come onto the shelves is a book by us <laughs> that has a title. No, I, I, we wrote like half of, maybe not even half of it. And then we're just like, you know, life is busy. What are we doing? And like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe one day I'll just take the unfinished manuscript and print it off and drop it off at the, the Barnes and Noble. Just I'll, I'll put it on the shelf. Um, you can just take it. I mean, it's not going to be in the system. Barnes and Noble is going to be confused. And they're like, we didn't order this. <laughs> like, I know nobody would. Luckily there's like 10 Barnes and Nobles in the U S so it's easy. Uh, just a, just a quick drop. Anyway, um, <laughs> Seth is a 2019 graduate of the University of Missouri, worked at a, a, a GP for a while and then started his own a little bit over a year ago. And so it's it's nice, you know, talking to somebody who, I mean, obviously, whenever anybody that I know um, continues forward and, and is building kind of upwards in the life, it, it's pretty cool to watch. Um, but specifically with him, we've talked so much about philosophy surrounding culture and um, education both, you know, in an academic institution and otherwise, you know, just kind of those principles. And it's nice to see someone kind of starting a practice and seeing what they're doing with those philosophies. And um, I, I think it's it's really cool. And it's nice to also kind of be on the, the outside a little bit watching the next phase of veterinary medicine, what that looks like. And, um, you know, I see it when I kind of dip in, but I'm mostly working within ER hospitals, which ideally, you know, best case scenario, most pet owners never have to meet me. Um, whereas best case scenario, you establish a good relationship with people like Seth. So, so it's nice, uh, to see what he's doing now with his life. And I'm curious about what's happening next or what, what, what happens from here. And with that, I'm going to do the thing that, um, Seth hates. He says when he's listening to podcasts, one of the things that he hates is, uh, someone introducing the guest, uh, and saying like, and here you go, because, you know, it indicates that, the interview was recorded at a totally different time than the intro, which it was. I mean, in this case, it absolutely was. I interviewed him like two weeks ago. Now I'm recording this. I don't even know if I made the recording. I mean, who knows? That was a lifetime ago. My brain doesn't remember two weeks ago. You crazy? But just in case there is one, I'm going to say, and with that, here is my conversation with Seth Williams. How's that, Seth? How's that? <laughs> the 
tough part for me was figuring out, like, uploading the audio and getting all, like, your tags and the bios in and how does it get to all the different platforms. The yeah. recording part, like, the actual audio, I did, like, my in my previous career, my previous life, I did all that. So right. I knew how to set all that up and basic, like, mixing and, you know, EQing, which you don't really have to do for this, but uh, that part was done. It was the learning all you know, the different platforms and hosting and all that. That was learning. Yeah, because I remember when we were doing stuff at the uh, uh, at, at Live Oak, you had talked about your sort of background in music producing and you know whatever that was. You had like mentioned this thing, and I'm like, all right, well, I need a lot more information. You went to school for that, and it wasn't it like music business something something. Yeah, so my degree was in music business, um, which entails uh, having like playing an instrument, but the, like ninety percent of my curriculum was in business curriculum, most of it with a music industry twist on it. Uh, okay. And then I they require you to have a couple of minors in the actual business school, um, you know, either business administration or marketing things like that. So. Um, kind of dabble in a lot of things, but it's really focusing on not playing music and not even making music, but um, ma- like you know, artist management, business law, copyright law, um, PR, and marketing, and really all all that what it takes behind the scenes in the music industry. Yeah, super How relevant you... to the veterinary industry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But how did you even get into that? Or how was that something that you're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go to school for this. Yeah. Uh, Well, I didn't, I didn't uh, originally. uh, And that's kind of like my, my weird path to where I am now, I guess. Um, So to make a very long story short, I thought I wanted to go to medical school. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a, a human doctor, but I loved music. And I wanted to go to a school where I could continue playing music and studying music but also be a biology major, do, do pre-med sciences mm. alongside music. And most schools wouldn't allow you to do that because the two curriculums were uh, way too heavy, uh, separate. So there were two schools that I found that I fell in love. And I wanted a smaller school, um, and it was actually it came down between Syracuse and Miami, University of Miami. Um, decided to go to Miami. Um, in my first year, I was doing both things. I was, you know, taking bio one and chem one and all, and then 18 hours of music class. <laughs> right. was, yeah. Cause there's not a lot of overlap in those prereqs. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> and it was not so much fun, but I loved, I loved business too. You know, growing up in my family, small business, like I always had that, that itch for small business and things like that. So mm. I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing the science and I can't keep doing the music. I don't even know if I want to keep doing the science because I don't like I wanted I want to be a doctor, but I don't know if I've got the stamina right now to do that. Mm, um, yeah. So I like you know went to the career counseling center and had like all these meetings and took all these aptitude tests and thinking that that was going to direct me into a more solid path to focus on. And uh, of course, I was split right down the well three ways between uh, <laughs> music and art, yeah. business, and science. I was like, well, right. great, excellent. So uh, <laughs> at that time, I was not a music business major, but then I was learning more about that program. I had several friends that were in that program. Um, so I figured, well, I could hit two of my three interests and be really happy. And, 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 and by that time, I thought you know, the, the music industry, the business side of it was really cool. So I yeah. switched gears with that. I was still in the music school, um, but I got to study business with it. And my, you know, my main focus was never really on performance and learning like really honing my my performance craft but being in the music school you know you you got to and you you had to continue studying it at least at a basic level um, right and that's which I, that's, it, yeah. was that drums for you or it was percussion classical percussion classical percussion oh yeah, yeah. so i was playing in you know the symphony and the, the big band and all that stuff so um, <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah because in music school, you had, you had two sides of it. You had the classical kids and then right. the jazz kids. Yeah. The jazz kids were cool. 
Hell, you wanted to be a jazzer. <laughs> yeah. But the level, at least in my opinion, the level of musicianship on the jazz side, crazy. Yeah. I mean, t- different, obviously, but like, you know, me growing up playing drums for fun, like, I looked like a toddler compared to these guys. It was <laughs> crazy. And, right. you know, several of them now that I knew I wasn't really friends with them, but um, they're playing drums like for, you know, well, they were like Pitbull and like Ricky Martin. Like, they're going on to like big. Wow time deal so uh it <laughs> yeah. was fun to watch um, yeah when i was in chicago the bassist for my rock opera was from the depaul music school and he was a jazz bassist yeah <laughs> oh my god he was phenomenal and yeah. it's like you know it's me uh a couple of buddies that i did improv with a guy who played guitar for one of the shows that i did beforehand and so it's like yeah we play music but then like this guy comes in right. he's doing things i didn't understand that the bass could even do <laughs> I don't know how you got involved. I don't know how you're having fun, but like, yeah. we're so grateful for you. I totally yeah. leave those like super depressed and like, what am I even doing? Like, yes. who taught me? And why am I just not, why am I not like that? And yeah. I realized that they're, they just got different blood in their system and it's all, it's all fine. I go to therapy and we're good. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you know yeah, what? And I, then you have to appreciate it too, because you watch those guys in like the practice rooms they're right. practicing like 12 hours a day, like just right. playing. So of yeah. course they're going to be that way. And of course I'm not that way because I don't spend more than an hour a week playing. So yeah, know, what do you expect? My best friend from third grade, um, he is now a professional violinist and he, I mean, it was like that, right? I would go over and he's like, well, I still have two hours of practice. And yeah. so he would like go to his room and we're like eight years old. And so he'd go to his room and he would play and I would just like hang yeah. out in his living room <laughs> and then he would be done. And he did that forever. And then now right. he's a fantastic. I mean, he was always fantastic at it, but yeah, it's yeah. just like practice and practice and practice. And then also like the skill to right. be able to do something with it. Right. So yeah. then did you, so what did you get? How far did you get into the industry after you graduated? Like, were you, were you like, in the management aspect, were you doing the business yeah, part? Yeah, I was doing it. Um, so I, I moved back to St. Louis, back home, and um, small time, not small time, I mean, he was, uh, it was a small organization. I wasn't like going to Nashville and like being part of this huge group, being a small fish in a very big right. pond. I, I, this this uh, guy that I worked for, who I actually knew growing up, because he was just starting his music career when I was very young, and we knew each other um from like camp and things like that. Um, reached out to him. I did an internship with him my senior year of college. Um, and he was the solo artist. Uh, he traveled the country. Um, and it, it sounds silly, but there, it's, it's pretty, I'd say it's legit. He, so take you know Christian rock music, which is, I think, arguably the unknown but biggest genre of music in the country oh, um, in, okay. terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, potential following and all of that may not be the biggest money maker, but it's, it's a huge genre. Um, this was the Jewish side of it. Um, okay. Which is not very popular. It's not a big (laughs) thing, but, uh, in that genre, this guy was kind of like one of the pioneers of like actually making it popular for young people. Mm -hmm. Um, so he, you know, he toured the country, you know, I mean, we're not talking about big shows, but, um, you know, playing 250 dates a year, whether it was, you know, it, camps or small concerts or things like that. So yeah, um, I was kind of his right hand man for four and a half years. Um, I was advancing his shows, producing his shows. Um, you know, a lot of the marketing, uh, at least putting together the marketing and then yeah. a lot of the business just minutia behind it all too. So I learned a lot. I learned, I really learned how to work with him. Like I didn't know, you know, I don't even think I knew how to study in college. I let alone work. So I learned work <laughs> right. ethic. I learned strategy and, time management, all that from him. And, and as I was nearing, you know, kind of that four year mark with him after, after graduating college, I was like, you know, I think I'm hitting my ceiling here. Like what's my next step? Do I yeah. find a, a gig in St. Louis? Do I move to Nashville or New York or do something big like that? And at the right. time I was dating Becca, my then fiance and, uh, and now wife. And, um, uh, I was like, you know, I really still want to do something in medicine. Like I still have this itch for science and yada, yada, yada. And at the same time, like, we'll get a little hokey here and, and teary eye, but um, 
at the t- at this time, my childhood dog, he was a golden, he was 14, his name was Teddy. Dang, um, wow. He got sick. Keep in mind, I was, I was not anywhere near the veterinary right. side yet. Right. But I was watching all this happen and, you know, the, the weekly or the, the, the twice monthly visit to the vet and he's declining and watching mm-hmm. all this happen and the connection between the vet and my parents and the dog and um, he pretty quickly thereafter passed away um, and I was like, you know, I think I could do that. Like, and I never thought of, I don't know why I didn't think about it until then and right. no one ever brought it up to me you know, even when I was talking about you know, going to medical school or my science interest, um, never did it come up about being a vet. Uh, but I'd always loved animals and, you know, it was a big part of, you know, who I was. Uh, and then I kind of put all this together, like, okay, I could work with animals, pretty sweet. I could practice medicine <laughs> and I could run a business too, if I wanted to. I could be right. the business person I always wanted to be as a veterinarian, much harder to do that on the on the human side, at least right now. Um, sure. So I was like, you know what? I th- it, it, it clicked. I was like, I think, I think that's what I got to do. Um, so I so did resigned. you, yeah. Yeah. From there, I mean, did you get involved in veterinary medicine, like as a, a tech or an assistant or did you just start applying? I did. I did. So I resigned from my, my previous career, which was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah. Uh, Cause this guy had given me so much. Um, and then I enrolled in the local university of Missouri arm of in St. Louis was mm. taking the prereqs again uh, that I really never took. And right. then I started shadowing, and then I got a job as an assistant at a, at a vet clinic in town. So I did that all th- for like two years while I was taking my prereqs again um, in undergrad again. Um, so, you know, did that, learned it, was falling in love every day, and I just knew that this is what I wanted to do. Um, and then I went and toured Mizzou. Uh, and actually, I, I don't know if we ever talked about this either, but was talking with the admissions director, or yeah, not the admissions um assistant, you know, kind of like the gatekeeper of the admissions office. Mm-hmm. She wasn't a vet. Yeah. She wasn't on the, on the, uh, board or, uh, committee or anything, but kind of went in with Becca and my, and my parents, we just toured and she was like, you know, with your undergraduate grades and you know, your history, you'll never get in. I'm like, <laughs> cool. Um, I was like, Thanks so now, now <laughs> yeah, but, but see, that's where she got wrong. Cause now I'm fired up and I'm like, okay, right. right. Uh, so, you know, applied, applied to several schools and miraculously got in probably cause I'm just, my path was weird and I'm weird and, you know, sure. um, and how but, old are uh, you at that point? Oh gosh. Uh, so 22, I was 25, 26. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Beck and I, I think it, we're almost married. Yeah. Almost married. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I, I wouldn't say that like I was a classic non-traditional student, but I was definitely not a traditional right. path, obviously. Yeah, which probably I helped. And honestly, I never would have made it through vet school if I'd done it from undergrad right into vet school. I had, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying this is true for everybody because obviously most people don't do what I did or take time time at least several years off. Yeah. I did not, I would not have succeeded. I, I wasn't, even, I mean, I wasn't even like, I was in the middle 50% of my class. If that, yeah. I would not have, I don't even think survived without having real world experience of learning how to work and study and like really just grind. Um, yeah. So I think, I think happens that, for a reason. Yeah. yeah I, I feel the same. I mean, I feel like it was definitely a service having all of this other life experience behind me before I went to vet school. It yeah. gave me a, Maybe not necessarily a tenacity to get through the curriculum, maybe, but I think it was more, it gave me perspective on the information and, yeah. and I feel like I approached it in a different way. Like, like if I've, you know, I've, I told you this before, like I would show up in like slacks and a polo and all that kind of stuff. And I'd be like, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. It is my job to understand all of these things. Right. And I, I don't know. I did, and then it just felt like the, there was a mix of knowledge, but also practicality and then coming into it, also having no idea what the vet veterinary industry was even like. I'm like, I just need all this information. But I think right. that the the perspective that I had being a non-traditional student, like definitely helped for yeah. sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You, you treat, you approach vet school more like a career than school. So if I right. approached it like school, I probably wouldn't have cared. But I knew right. that this was going to be 
I won't say the rest of my life, but the next, what, 50 years of my life. And I had, you know, the hard <laughs> yeah. part was, uh, the, uh, the hard part was over. Getting in was, was that first of many big hurdles. Yeah. But now you're preparing for the real deal. So there was a, um, a purpose, a, a purpose to it. And I knew that the, the things that I was going to, I was learning in vet school, I was going to use most of it at least mm-hmm. versus like, uh, maybe I'm in undergrad, you know, do I use physics anymore? <laughs> do I, do I use organic chemistry? Yeah. yeah. De- definitely, definitely not that. But so, I mean, it's like you're, you're I feel like with undergrad, you're jumping through the hoops just to get into the door to be considered for whatever advanced degree you want to, you want to get. And once you're there, that's when the work, the fun begins. Yeah. 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 Yeah, That's really interesting. And, and like, okay. So then when you were in vet school, at some point you decided to like start this podcast. Cause, and I think that was after, like, after we met, is that right? I mean, where in your veterinary career did you start this thing, and what was the impetus for that? Oh, man, now you're asking me to really think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think the podcast was a thing when when we met at that externship. Yeah, I don't think um, so either. I feel like we would we would have talked about that more. Um, I think, and I don't remember kind of why I had the idea. I just thought that podcasting was cool, and I was listening to podcasts. And I'm like. You know, I kind of want something to do outside of school. I mean, I was, you know, uh, there wasn't much time, obviously, but um, right. like, you know, I've got the, the audio background. You know, I, I could I could fake my way through that and get decently good at it, good enough at it. But the 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 main like stimulus was I knew there wasn't anything out there for vet students, let alone at right. the time for for the veterinary community. That that was actually really good. And I was speaking more for the vet school, uh, the vet student side, but. Um, the vet pro- podcasts that were out there, the content was good. The production quality was not good. And I think back, right. you know, that was what, seven, no, not seven years ago, f- five, six years ago. Right. This was when kind of podcasting was really kind of getting its, its push. Um, but I knew I could make a good product and I knew that I could make good content when I had the time to do it. Um, so uh, I just kind of, you know, took another dive and just leap of faith and it, and it yeah. worked. Um, and the so, original intent of that podcast was like directed towards vet school, vet students to what, like survive vet yeah. school. Is that? Yeah. Uh, I think part of the, I would say 90% of it was targeted towards, towards current vet students. And mm-hmm. then we had some podcasts that were geared more towards the prospective vet students. Um, yeah. but it was all about having conversations about things that we typically didn't talk about in school. Yeah. Uh, yeah that uh and and topics that were not directly related to academics let's say you know some of the softer skills or the challenges and um you know goals like what happens after vet school and all these things um that there's just not enough time for in the vet school curriculum to talk about or just things that we need to talk about because we're facing hardship or a challenge of some sort um and and there was a platform to do it And, and it really wasn't the goal was not for me to be talking to people, to to the audience, it was me bringing in people that I knew or people that I reached out to that'd be willing to talk about things, and I would just ask questions. Um, yeah. So, um, luckily, we, we found a lot of people. I don't know how many episodes we did; probably like I don't know, sixty or so, um, right. and uh, all with a guest. Most, I think, most with a guest, um, and it was well received. And I think people are still listening to it. It's been uh, it's been <laughs> at least awesome. four years since I since I've put one out. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it's really interesting to what I've noticed about the veterinary community in, in the, at least doing this. Um, but I, I feel like in general, people are very generous with their time. Yep. Like it's it's not that hard to get people involved in your project because I, I feel like it's maybe uniquely <clears throat> I think it's unique to this industry where it's like we all want to support each other to some extent. I think that we all understand that we're in this thing together. So it's like if you have an opportunity to talk to vet students especially but to be involved in something where you're communicating with the rest of the field i think we are like compelled to be involved in that yeah i agree i think of all the professionals out there i think veterinarian or the vet community i mean not, not just veterinarians anyone in the vet community are very willing to help when they can yeah um, generally just very kind and good hearted people not that 
other professions aren't, but I think uh, <laughs> those uh, dentists are jerks. <laughs> They're the I mean, worst. Really, it's like pulling hard as molars. Them. Those people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting too, because all that's, you know, those topics, especially as you're, when you're in vet school, I I feel like, yeah, there's a, you know, it's like, oh, this, this class, like, how do we survive this class and blah, blah, blah. But there is something very real about like, how is it that you are putting all these humans through this experience and expecting them to come out learning anything yet, you know, it consistently works, right? Like we come out, we know things, we become veterinarians. Um, but like constantly within the middle of it, we're just like, this cannot be the most efficient way to learn this information. No, this cannot be no. the best way to transmit, you know, an educational material. Right. So 100%. yeah, we're, we're very much, uh, overcome by the plight of vet school when we're in it as well. So yeah, I'm sure part that, that of it was, too was like, just, and, and again, I, I know that I'm not, I, I may be the majority. I don't, I don't even know, but, um, speaking from just personal experiences, like with you know the testing and drinking from the fire hose, you know with everything there. Right. At that point, I was trying to survive and get through it. I did not care about getting an A in every class. Like I just wanted to pass and be a you know try as hard as I could, but just be a generally good student. I knew though that I was going to really learn and and hone all of these skills after vet school. Um, right. Let me get the foundation down. Let me get familiar with the material. I don't think I can physically internalize it all right now. And probably just because I didn't have the learning skills at that time. I felt like I, I really learned and grew and internalized everything after I graduated. And in those first six months, even a year, year and a half. Um, not saying that I went out, I left school like knowing nothing, like right. having not paid attention. <laughs> it was just like, uh, yeah. you know. I'm just a real world learner. I'm not great at lecture based classes. Um, and I agree. That's, we've probably spent dozens of hours, you and I talking about the right. learning, the teaching techniques. And I don't know what the right, what the right way to do it is, but um, I know that it could be yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah. I think that's in general. I mean, not, not just <laughs> that school, but um, yeah. And I, I, I guess I'll mention it now. Cause I, I just, I was listening to something today and, um, it, 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 it's applicable to this conversation too, but it was uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I think is amazing. Um, he was like, do you know why people cheat on exams? And he said, it's because it's not because the student is trying to you know, get around, cut corners. It's, it's that the curriculum values the grade more than the teaching and, yeah. and, and supporting the student to learn. Like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, that sounds that you care right. more about just getting that number than learning and and like what the actual point of school is. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's you know, it's, you have to come up with a metric for approximating some some level of understanding, and that's the metric that we've come up with is this sort of grade thing. But as we know, right. it's very imperfect, and the right. You know, and then the closer we get to, you know, things like um, uh, multiple choice tests and, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, well, this is very, very far away from you can reason your way through a multiple choice test without really knowing the information, right, um, which is right. how I took the NAVLE. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you too. <laughs> <laughs> like, you you know, you, you don't have to necessarily like really understand the information as opposed to some of these other ways. But the other ways are you know, much more personnel heavy or human resources dependent that, right. you know, we just don't uh, unfortunately have the financial resources to do right. or to, to utilize. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And, you know, you could say the same thing about admissions, you know, admissions into graduate programs in general. And, and you're right. It's not just veterinary school, right? It's, it's all of these professional programs. They're, they have the same issues across the board, surely. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You so. know what I'm curious about is, did you, so something that happens, I think for all of us in vet school is that we lose that thing that kind of made us, you know, who we are within vet school. So whatever that artistic thing that we did beforehand, or, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I really love to travel or I'm a, you know, super into photography or whatever. We like lose that because we're so focused on vet school. 
did right. you find that doing the podcast, you know, helped you in, in some way to kind of reclaim some of your identity or do you feel, or do you feel at all like, uh, you know, you were still sort of floundering in that? I would say probably the latter. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that the podcast more provided an outlet for me, both a creative outlet, but also just a, a relaxation outlet away from school. Just kind of take a yeah. break and use a different part of my brain, which, you know, I think at the time I didn't think about, but thinking back now was probably really important. Um, used to spend an hour or two a week just not doing vet school. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So, um, in terms of like, you know, let's use like my, uh, my, my musicianship, if you will. Yeah, uh, I will. I'll allow it. I, yeah, let's do it. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was a vet school that, that kind of drew me away from that. Um, I think it was just life in general. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, getting married and having kids and working and now starting a business there, you just got to prioritize things and, um, yeah. that it's still a priority, but it's much lower on the list than it used to be. So, yeah. um, one day it'll come back. Absolutely. Um, but I, I think, Maybe two being a little bit older, starting vet schools, and I already already had a little bit more of uh, of a self identity than I did like post undergrad, like immediately post undergrad. I had you know lived and worked and built a life for a few years, several years before vet school, and that I right. think generally stuck um, stuck with me through vet school. Partly, probably going and coming back full circle is that I didn't treat vet school like school. I treated it more like my pre-job job, you know, right. like it, it was going to work every day to prepare myself to actually go and do, make a career out of something that, that I loved. Yeah. 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 Especially because like what you're saying uh, a, a while back is that, you know, you had, your family had a business, you were always sort of aligned with some business and or business, um, proclivity or, you know, path. And, and then you have all these other sort of things swirling around and as they come closer and closer together, now you're in vet school, you're shooting forward. You're like, okay, well, I know that I'm going to be, you know, doing this medicine thing. I'll probably be starting a business. I have to be sort of paying attention. Like this is the beginning of that entire trajectory. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And even with the business side too, like I, I knew I always wanted to do that. I always knew I wanted to have my own practice and kind of yeah. had these visions that I, uh, you know, was starting day one of before vet school. Cause part of making that decision to go to vet school was that I had this goal to be a business person and have be, be in practice ownership. So, um, you know, from day one, I was you know, doing VBMA and, um, you know, talking to professors or you know, anyone that could give me guidance about, ownership in the business side of veterinary medicine, which as most people in the veterinary world know, we don't get a ton of that in vet school. Um, no, not at all. get any of it. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, that was always part of the, part of the game plan too, was any, and, and even as, you know, getting into third and fourth year, um, you know, doing like the Live Oak Bank externship, going right. to like the Uncharted Vet Conference and um, just other conferences and just meeting people um, that, that really, you know, helped and paid off and just by making connections and, and getting some, some mentors along the way. What do you think that it was about business in particular that, that kind of led you in that way? Like why start a business? Why was that interesting to you? I like the management side of it. Um, you know, the, the people side, I like the numbers side and yeah. kind of watching things grow and change and making these, uh, you know, on the fly changes to, to help keep the business um, healthy. But I, I guess just the strategy and the putting in all this work to have this product at the end was really cool to me. Um, right. And it wasn't about being like the face of the business or anything like that. And um, I think it was, uh, especially with, with what we have now, is I had this vision and it was a pretty unique vision. And I knew that I uh, thought that the only way, the only feasible way to get there um, was to do what I'm doing now, which is to, to start it um, right. and kind of try to change the veterinary experience in the way that I think it could be changed. 
Um, yeah. But it was, it, it, there's, there's, a, there's a drive there and a reward. I can't really put it into words, but um, it is a, it's an equally, if not more, motivating factor for me every day than the medicine part. I love the medicine part. Absolutely. I love, I love practicing, and I hope I never stop that. But um, I'm equally driven by the business side, too. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that I, which I'm also curious about, I have some questions about as well. Um, <clears throat> but the way that like, I guess back when you were starting and designing the the practice and you had like the whole layout and you're like, here, you know, what are your thoughts having gone into as many hospitals as you've gone into? Yeah. Yeah. I did think it was pretty cool that it's like, you are doing the thing that we all keep kind of talking about. Which, you know, we keep saying, like, things have to change. You know, this experience that, that we're all having is, you know, whatever. It's not enjoyable for the veterinarian. It's not enjoyable for the client. You know, so we're sort of seeing this new phase of veterinary medicine. And you're kind of being a part of that, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular when you, when about kind of like way, the... Yeah. <laughs> I, it's just like, you know, like the exam rooms that don't close or they're kind of a part of this kind of general... I don't know. It's not even like a, I guess it's a waiting area type of thing, but you know, that yeah. without a front desk and like right. a frosted glass, did you do the frosted glass that you could see or like see through to the treatment area? Um, so not yet. Uh, okay. two reasons for that. Uh, and I guess for, for, for those listening, the, uh, the original vision was to, ha- instead of having a wall that separated the treatment area from reception or exam rooms, whatever it was, was to make it a window and people can see literally front to back to the clinic. Um, My worry with that vision was that let's say we've got um, a very unsightly situation, blood or whatever it is, or you have an emergency, a hit by car or some uh, uh, cardiac arrest, something like that. Something you don't want the public to see. What are you going to do? Um, right. and that's where this smart glass concept came in where we've got the window, but then we put this either a film up or make it just part of the glass where you flip a switch and it becomes a frosted pane of glass. So you can't see through, yeah. um, construction, uh, and, and design was all happening right at the beginning of COVID and, right. uh, it really came down to budget, <laughs> uh, and we, you know, went in with uh, a budget number for construction. This was pre-COVID, and then COVID hit, and cost of goods went up, cost of labor right. went up. My yeah. construction budget literally doubled. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I remember when two by fours were like you know eight dollars or <laughs> whatever. Yeah, it was. yeah. Uh, so as I was pooping my pants um, <laughs> about what to do. Um, yeah. You know, we kind of went to the went back to the drawing board a little bit. And we're like, hey, what can we change? Still keeping the theme and the vision and and the goals here. And something that was at the bottom of the list was taking away the frosted glass. Um, right. What I will say though is, and I'm going to knock on wood, cross, do whatever I need to do, uh, do a rain dance. We have not <laughs> needed it yet. Okay. Um, and we've had we've had situations where we could have used it, um, but my thing is now, well. If we're going to use it less than three times a year, do we actually need? It? I mean, it's 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 cool. Right. It's sweet, and people were talking about it before we opened. The, the people were, like uh, reps were coming in, like I got to see this glass. Uh, yeah, like, sorry. Um, what else <laughs> <laughs> um, During those times, you just have someone like painting the inside of the glass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought of having like a a curtain, and you have someone like pull the strings real quick, <laughs> bring it across. Um, Only if it's like a true theater, like a red velvet. That's curtain. what I was thinking. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. the band starts playing and <laughs> right, lights turn exactly. off. Um, yeah, so we'll probably do it one day. Um, it well, but it sounds like so you have like glass, glass, so they can still see it's straight through. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I was going to say though. It. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's, I guess the the downside would be maybe from a privacy perspective for the individual whose dog you're talking about. Right. You know, so like say that, you know, someone did have a, a dog who was hit by a car and having them rush back and then you got a bunch of like people standing up against the glass. Right. Like, right. Uh, like what was that? Was it 
JC Penny commercial or Mervin's or something like that with like <laughs> open, open. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, you got a bunch of those people. Yeah. Um, and yep. I guess that could be a downside. But, you know, other than that, I think that if people are interested in watching the process, in my opinion, I mean, my, my opinion has sort of changed on this over the years, but I, I believe that that does add a huge value. It, it informs the customer to the value of what you're doing. Right. And that was exactly part of why we did it. Not the, not the whole reason, but that was one of the, 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 the pillars of why we did it was that it provides value in two ways. One, it provides value to the pet owner to know what we're doing, uh, period, but to see yeah. how we're doing it, see the facility, you know, that yeah. we're actually like a medical practice. Like we're not just, you know, <laughs> right. I, I, I can't even imagine what people think we do like in the back, you know, which right. we, we don't take it. That, but, <laughs> it's um, like a shipping container. <laughs> right. Right. I'll go, I'll go out to the garage and like do something, which right. I've been in clinics where it was a garage and more power to them. But, um, right. you know, providing like, you know, you're paying for these services, but look at what you're getting. And, and look yeah. how well your animal is being treated. So that was part one. But on the flip side is showing the value of like what our staff does and what everyone does behind the scenes. Um, yeah. And that's helped. And uh, part of the feedback that I got, which for what it's worth, this came from like my mother and my mother-in-law um, was, <laughs> and, and, and we're laughing at because well, But she uh, hates me, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't talk anymore. No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, I was like, yeah, I've got this 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 concept. Like, where you can see everything. You can see anesthesia, and you can see certain. You can't really see. You can see what's going on in surgery, but you can't really actually see the surgery. But you sure. can see dentistry and all these, you know, all the animals that are being hospitalized. You really wanted them people to see that. I don't want to see my dog anesthetized. I'm like, okay, thanks for crushing my <laughs> dreams, mom. Um, <laughs> but uh, now they get it, and, and like that was the thing, right. you know. You got to go with your gut. Like I, I, for whatever reason, I knew it was a risk, but I, I just knew it was going to work. Um, yeah. And I definitely wasn't the first person to do this and have this concept. Sure. Um, I was one of the first, but not the first. But now look at all these new clinics that are popping up that are doing the same thing because yeah. it works and people enjoy seeing it. Um, so, yeah. That's do you that. find that, I mean, in terms of getting associates, like it's one thing if you just, if it's just you. And you're like, right. I got an idea. And like, you go for it and you like con some people to like work with you. But yeah. like, what about like veterinarians? I mean, are you finding that people like one, I don't know how anyone finds a, a veterinarian in this like economy. Like, how do you even get one hired, <laughs> you know? And then two, like, how, you know, do you find that they're intrigued by it or are they kind of put off by or intimidated by this idea that everything that they do now someone can see them do it's it? Watched. That was a worry for me. I was more worried about the the staff, the nursing staff being uh, a little bit on guard or have like the you know tension heightened because that they were on display. Um, right. But I haven't seen any issue with that so far. Um, I think it keeps everybody a little bit more honest. Not that there was a problem with honesty or like behavior, things like that, but people know that you could be watched. Um, sure. uh, on the vet side of things, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough that I've hired uh, a second veterinarian that she started in the in the fall um i've also hired our third veterinarian that's starting in the summer this coming summer who's a new graduate um the uh, the the my second vet uh, we were classmates together actually so we've been talking for a while and nice talking about this 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 vision that i had and um she was on board and you just the timing worked out perfectly and um you know looking for a change but then this uh uh, our third associate, um, she actually reached out to me and and knew what we were doing and knew that we mm-hmm. were different. Um, so, I mean, can't explain how fortunate and lucky I was that someone sought me out. Um, yeah. But I think the success there is that we're doing something different and that people are looking for a change, especially the younger generation, um, that are a little bit tired of what I would call a little bit of like just a stale culture. The medicine is great. I think, generally speaking, our medical skills are as, as good uh, as they've ever been. But our facilities, our culture, the way that we just do things is, could be improved. So we're we're doing that, and um, people can see that. You know, whether it's through social media or just hearing about us through the grapevine. Um, yeah. But again, with with veterinarians, I've, I've been reached out by them. Um, 
to want to see what we're doing just because they're interested. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. And what do you feel like you're doing that's different? <clears throat> like I was looking on your website a little while back and it said something along the lines of like, we don't do things the same way or, or whatever it, yeah. whatever it is. We do things differently. Um, like yeah. what do you, what do you think that is? So I, I think it comes down to the experience for the patients and the clients and also the staff too, to be honest with you. Um, a, a place that I knew I wasn't going to be able to differentiate myself was the medicine. Cause I'll say virtually. I don't know anything. <laughs> no, I mean like <laughs> yeah. car mechanic, that <laughs> same thing, you know, no. Um, yeah. if you look at any vet, vet website, and they all say, you know, sure, premier, compassionate care, excellence right. in medicine. Like we all practice excellent medicine, right? Right, right, right. High quality and, medicine at a affordable cost or whatever it is. Right, right. right. To help as many um, people as absolutely possible. Right. Yeah. Do the clients really understand what A plus medicine is versus like C average medicine is? Probably not. Um, right. Unless, unless we're talking about. Um, you know, a general private practice like me versus the university, which we're still practicing the same quality medicine, but they've got some advanced things that they can do there just based on knowledge and equipment. But I knew that me just saying we were different because we practice high quality sure. medicine. So does everybody. And I can't prove that, right. you know, um, I can just prove it in, in, in how I treat these patients. But with how our facility looks and how our facility flows, uh, you know, you come in, the building and, and you're not sitting in the waiting room you go right to your exam room where you're um kind of like in our loungy area it's not a waiting room um the 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 animals have windows that they look that can look out of at, in their exam room so they're not closed in um right going back to the window in the treatment you can see everything we're, we're a you know transparent open book to, to what we're doing um but then also the tech part too like i one of my biggest um areas of improvement that i thought that the vet world could could use was was uh, employing and, and using technology. Um, so, you know, really trying to be, we're like 90% paperless, um, mm. but like s simple things that most people are doing now, but uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, they weren't, you know, booking appointments online and refilling prescriptions online, um, right. chatting with us, texting with us, um, you know, using email for Pete's sake, like, you know, just doing things that <laughs> you weren't using, you know, sending, instead of sending up postcards with, Right, your vaccine right. reminders. Um, right, right. So just making the experience from A to Z, from booking to checking out to communication, and then what the experience is in the clinic, improving that. And that's how we're different. Um, yeah. It's really a, just, again, about the total experience. Yeah, I I do like that. I mean, and it's it's interesting because I think that, like, you know, we think about best medicine as being some sort of you thing that is derived out of a textbook or that some, you know, internist tells us. But I do think that a, the experience is a huge piece of the medicine, or at least your perceived value of the medicine that you've received. Right. Um, you know, I think about this, there's this story, and I'll, I'll try to be vague about it because <clears throat> I don't know, but um, somebody was telling me, it was in another country, but there was a guy who lived, uh, you know, out kind of in the hills and he never really went to the doctor, but, you know, just, he wasn't feeling very well. And it was convinced by his wife to go down into the city and, and go see the doctor. So he like, you know, got on his horse and he went down and, and, you know, saw the person and, and the person explained to him that he had, um, they, they found like gall, gallbladder stones. And so he's like, oh, you have to have a surgery to remove these. And then, you know, that was it. So he went back up um, to his house. But the thing is like that, that's this guy was a, you know, he lived out in the middle of nowhere and, and by trade, he was a, a butcher. Like he would come down into the city, uh, you know, it would be there. He, like he rode his horse in, like there was no roads or anything like that. He rode his horse in, he would do like the butcher butchering. Mm, I don't know. And then he would go back. <laughs> um, and so in his mind, what surgery looked like was that he was going to be flayed open like one of the cows that he normally butchers right. and he just couldn't really stand that. And so he actually committed suicide because of that. Right. And I think about that because that doctor had an opportunity 
of course I wasn't there, but it's like, I, there was something, there was a mismatch between, you know, obviously the reality of the situation and um, what the medical facts were as understood by the doctor and then what this person perceives. And I just like think about that all the time about how important it is to like really truly understand where the other person is coming from and having them like the clients feel heard yep. and truly trying to understand why they're there and what their resistance is and all that kind of stuff. I think about that all the time. And so I know it's not exactly the same, but it is a part of, you know, the, the experience of the medical right. visit. Right. And then, you know, obviously the care is very different. Right. Um, well, I think so. it's exactly the same in terms of perspective. You're actually, we're absolutely right. Is that people, and we all, I feel like we always forget about what we thought about veterinary medicine before we decided to go to veterinary school. Like, cause we had right. no idea. Um, right. And I think it's important to can try to remember that because that's what our clients yeah. are thinking. Like we, they could be thinking a whole bunch of stuff. Like, um, uh, so that was again, part of the reason where we would invite people to watch to see what happens, uh, right. when we would need to take their dog, let's say to the treatment area to do something. Um, is because I, I, you know, when I was kind of pitching this idea, I was saying uh, that people probably thought that, like for surgery days, that their dogs are in this, you know, wire cage on the ground, barking and totally anxious, right. and no one's paying attention to them. It's a really painful, stressful experience for them. And gosh, yeah. we never want to, never want to do that. Well, yeah. now you can see it, and like the dogs are just sleeping in their kennel, and they're relaxing, and they're having a good time. Uh, they've got, you know, very qualified nursing staff you know, when they, when they need the care that they're there for, um, they just see what it actually looks like. So part of it was removing the, the mystery of what happens at the vet. Now, granted, we try to do as many things in the exam room as we can, but obviously there's things we can't do, um, right. surgery yeah. or treatment, things like that. Yeah. Um, but I really, I really feel sorry that people appreciate seeing what goes into it and seeing what it's actually like. Um, yeah. A good example of it too. Uh, this is just a, a, a one example is um, like Spays, for example. You know, um, and I use I use Spays, especially when I talk to like vet students. Because I, I and call me you know whatever you want to call me. I I think a Spay surgery is probably one of the more challenging surgeries that I do, especially yeah. when talking about like a big dog that's like four years old and just, you know, <laughs> right fat and. You know, yeah, it's it's challenging. It's stressful. Um, one of our surgery spay, professors says that it is in the top fifty percent of difficult surgeries. Yeah, it is yeah. one of the most difficult surgeries yeah. that they do. Right now, do I spay multiple animals every week? Yes. Yeah, so it's the most common thing that I do. Right. So going back to perception is that you know, we 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 uh, give a treatment plan to an owner. You know, here's your spay estimate. Blah blah blah. Um, you know, big dog, and we're talking what five seven hundred dollars. What for a spay? It's just a spay. Like I could go down <laughs> right. the street and get a spay for fifty dollars with me. You know, right. Yes, you could. But let me show you what we're doing here. And then they, yeah. you know, they can see our OR. They can see our prep area. Uh, they can see that we're, you know, it looks like a human OR where we're all gowned up and not all of us. You know, I'm gowned up and everyone's wearing masks. Right. We're doing anesthesia. Like this yeah. is not just, um, you know. A very simple, inexpensive, minor procedure. Right. So, th again, going back to adding value, um, but showing people what what stuff actually is. Now, I haven't had anyone take me up on watching surgery yet. I'm kind of hoping someone will because we've set it up for that. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, because they're open, they're 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 uh, invited to. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, just another example of everything we've been talking about so far. Yeah. You know, I, there's an opportunity here, like something that, that you mentioned, which I think is interesting is that like when I was a kid, my experience with the vet was not good. I mean, it was like this small clinic that was dingy and I just like, I didn't like being in there. And I, I just felt like, you know, the way that they, we had a cat and cats are notoriously pains in the ass. And <laughs> so like, you know, the, the way they like handled it, I just like, I did not get a good vibe from that yeah. at all. And it was very closed off. It was like a small place. It, you were basically in the reception area, which was maybe, maybe a hundred square feet, two little right. doors that were the exam rooms. And then like the door in the back, which was the treatment area. And I just like, did not ever want to go. Like we just didn't, 
we kind of occasionally vaccinated our animals <laughs> you know, because I just didn't want to go to the vet. Yeah. And I, I think that the opportunity is that, you know, if you can provide an experience even for little kids or, you know, people who may potentially be interested in being veterinarians, I mean, providing that experience would potentially get them even more interested. Right. Like I wonder, like I got here, but I got here in like a very weird roundabout way. Although everything in my youth tells me that I probably should have been interested in this a long time ago. I was yeah. just so turned off by it. Yeah. So, Agreed. Agreed. That's an interesting I, opportunity. Yeah. I, I, I always think about like, I don't know why I remember this because you, you, you jogged my memory. It was, um, again, my childhood golden. And this, I mean, I was like, you know, less than 10 years old, um, uh, going to the vet and it was, you know, your classic old school, you know, kind of what you would think of, you know, nineties vet. Um, I remember the waiting room. That's all I remember is the waiting room. So you walk in, it's a very small waiting room. Uh, you had chairs set up like an L, you know, right. uh, and they were, they yeah. were the old, uh, you know, wire frame plastic, you know, single surface <laughs> yeah, yeah. chair. Um, and you know, there were, 12 chairs in a space that should have only been holding six. And mm. in that space, there were like 15 dogs and they're all right. sniffing each other and barking. And <laughs> it was not a calm situation. And then yeah. they, uh, and this clinic was a walk-in clinic. So they didn't think it was a you know, first come first serve. So you're sitting there for how long? Um, and you get called up and you go in your room and you do the thing. So um, it, it's just, you're right. Not enjoyable. Like I wouldn't have made, right come to the vet, something you look forward to on a, for a good visit, obviously not a, not a bad, right. but yeah, something that you actually kind of, I don't know if you like want to go to really any appointment, <laughs> you know, it's not, yeah. like, take time out of your day, but it's at least not something that you feel like maybe that much more anxious for. Cause it's already stressful, right. right? Like, especially with cats or dogs that don't want to go or, you know, it's like, oh, I got to take time off of work because most vet hospitals are, are open during bank hours, right? When everyone else is working and right. Right. Yeah. It's a whole thing. So why make it even more stressful by cramming right. people? <laughs> it's like you and your great Pyrenees, get in with the rest of them. <laughs> Just like jamming them into the right. lobby. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Cattle call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like that. I like that as an idea. I'm really curious about kind of what happens next. And I, I like, because I, I think about this as, you know, we're at this kind of interesting precipice and, and we probably have been for, for a, a little while where there's like something, we're at a tipping point, like something is going to change. Like we have to, like it has to. And one of the things that people you know, people talk about is how do we encourage people to even become veterinarians in the future? Um, and right. I think that things that you're talking about give us that opportunity a little bit. Yeah. And I'm honestly a little bit more concerned, not about how to get people to want to become veterinarians, but how to keep them being veterinarians. Yeah. I think, because obviously, I mean, we've got a surplus of, of students that want to go to vet school and the vet schools are always going to be, are always full, uh, or at least from what I know at their capacity. But I think that the amount of the retention, um, of veterinarians from what I understand is, is daunting, at least how we're trending and support staff too, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. I think support staff is a, a really good point as well. I mean, you know, especially from a fiscal perspective, right? If we don't necessarily have the, you know, it's like if we're talking about paying veterinarians better and and I think that we're moving in that direction. I think that the income is actually increasing. I know that it is, right? The averages are significantly higher than they were when, you know, I graduated in 2017. Um, yep. but I think that a similar conversation has to happen with nursing staff and, you know, all the support staff cuz yeah. it's crazy yeah. that you can either do this very difficult thing or you can like work at a Starbucks and Starbucks would probably pay you better. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about that cause I mean the year, well COVID changed a lot, right. In terms of wages and all of that. Um, before the vet world kind of got their act together during COVID an entry level vet assistant could make more as a cashier at Panera than as a vet tech. Um, 
Yeah. And I'm not saying that Panera is invaluable because I'm there multiple times a week. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those bread but, bowls, man. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, wages have gone up as they, we are way overdue for that. Um, I am curious to see where pricing goes. Um, you know, everything's yeah. going up on the cost side. How is that going to be translated to the client side too? Um, especially keeping up with wages and, um, you know, just everything, um, which would be a whole nother Have you podcast. Had to... about... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A whole like season of, <laughs> of like the financial implications right. of what happens next. Um, have you had to raise prices during these past couple of years? Um, I only raised prices after the turn of this year, right back in or January this this month. Right. Um, not out of um, like a necessity because oh, um, wages have gone up, or uh, just because we can, because people will pay for it. But because of just the typical like yearly increases for right. you know our pharmaceuticals and our supplies and I suppose like lab lab work and things like that, mm-hmm. um, so you know normal I, well I say normal I think the inflationary pressure has really played a role in all those increases we we were seeing like uh, mid year increases for a lot of things too which apparently right. doesn't happen um, yeah but. Um, I didn't. I did not raise them significantly. Where it's like, oh, MetroVet was at one time pretty affordable. Now it's like, what the heck's happening here? Um, sure. No. Our our pricing structure was to not be the most expensive in town, but be up there to reflect the quality of care that we're providing and everything. Um, but definitely yeah. not to be uh, to the point where we'd be considered like non affordable for the the typical pet owner in our area. Right. Yeah, which is, I mean, I think that that's commiserate with, with the experience that you're providing, right? I mean, right, right. at the end of the day, you are adding an additional value to it. And there's a cost associated with it. And I think that it's okay to charge more for it. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and how we're, you know, how we're, how we're paying our, our staff, which is, I think what they deserve, it's certainly above average, but it's got to be reflected somewhere, you know, right. um, yeah. on the, on the, the the cost side of things so yeah because i talk to a lot of actually i mean i guess i don't talk to too many gp owners anymore but i do you know i go to enough of these practices where there's a resistance to raising rates i do know that there's a there's this resistance that happens with small business owners that it's like oh well i can't raise rates because then no one will ever pay for it it's like then my competition right. will take over and i right. you know i mean i understand that to a point but also, like you kind of have to, in my opinion, you have to believe that what you're offering is worth what it is that you're charging. And at the end of the day, if there's inflationary pressures or you're paying your staff better and, and all that kind of stuff, there's like the reality of inflation. And there's also the, you know what, we're charging more because we're, we're paying these people better. And if we pay them better, we're going to retain people and they're going to gain more experience. And that ultimately serves you better. Therefore, the value is higher. So... Yeah, I, I, I've got a couple of thoughts on that too, because I, I and I agree where where it's coming from, and the fear of what the clientele is going to think and how they're going to react. Um, but but first point is, if you feel that strongly that your clientele is tied to your practice because of the prices, and only and mainly because of the prices, maybe think about ways to get them tied to your practice that are not financially related. Yeah. If you were to charge 10 to 20% more, what could you do to keep them there? You know, is, is the client service, um, where it should be is the level of care, the level of service, the facility, all these facets, um, of the experience, let's put it that way. Um, go into that, go into that like client retention. Yeah. I don't think it should solely be because of price point, unless you're in one of those areas where truly there, it's a financially, um, constricted area clientele demographic and there are practices that that is priority one is keeping the price point down for the community and because of the demographic totally get that right 
on point two. And uh, I, I say this not to express that I do not put my medical care at top of the list, but truly deep down, my staff is my number one priority because without my staff, I'm nothing. Mm. Um, so that was part of the, um, the goal in setting everything up was to find a solid staff that was on board with our philosophy and that taking care of them was a main point, a main goal for me. Um, not just monetarily, but culture wise. Um, and, uh, you know, work life balance and support, whether it was personal support, whether it's professional support, you know, CE and skills and all of that, because I knew that keeping a team together and re- retaining that team is going to make, it's going to be the big success factor for the practice. Um, and losing staff because they're not happy for one of those reasons, it could be one or many of them, um, is going to hurt the practice, not only monetarily, but culturally. And then we can't see as many patients. And then, you know, it's just a downward spiral from there. So, um, yeah, wages are going up as they should, but that's just been the the cultural pressure and course of things anyways. But it it has to keep falling down the line, you know, because, because you gotta, you gotta make a successful business too. And that's actually the third point, which I almost forgot to mention, uh, kind of going back to what you were saying about some practice owners being a little bit uh, timid about price increases. Mm -hmm. And I think that it may be getting better because we're talking about it more, but I feel like a lot of veterinarians, I'm not saying the majority of them, but a lot of them, business owners, practice owners are afraid of the word profit and making money. Right. Um, Because it's like it sounds or feels greedy or insensitive, or it's not why I got into veterinary medicine. Was not you know I'm not coming in to make to get rich and to make money. Right. But to keep a business going, you have to be profitable, Uh, or else you can't reinvest in the business. You can't repair things and get new equipment and grow and do all these things. So there's got to be something left over, And, and and. Get on, get on my soapbox for a second here. It's like, you know, people, I, I would hear it all the time in vet schools that uh, I hope you're not going into veterinary medicine to make a lot of money. Right. Well, <laughs> d- am I going to become like <laughs> Bill Gates or, you know, a, a, a multi millionaire, billionaire person? Not just by practicing medicine, no, but I'm expecting to make a good, good enough living where I'm comfortable and satisfied with that and satisfied enough to keep going back to work yeah so it's not like we're going you know we i want to be a veterinarian because i want to be a martyr and and you know make you know money at the poverty line no it's not that <laughs> don't go into thinking you're making you're gonna make 10 million dollars a year right but don't go into think you're making nothing you know and money's not bad you know again going back to you know profit is not a bad word um yeah. but uh that's you know, okay. Step yeah. off my soapbox. But, well, and I would say that um, I mean to just kind of add to that, I think that businesses sort of by nature influence the way that the the world works, right? So like I don't know, feel how you want to feel about Apple. Like at the end of the day, a lot of those products have just changed the way that we interact with the world, right? And I do and you know, if that was a nonprofit. Or if all of those people were kind of working at the poverty line, they wouldn't have created those things. There is a business driver to that then inspires innovation. And I think that right. veterinary medicine is absolutely one of those fields where that's what we kind of need is we need that innovation and sort of, you know, altering the way that we do things moving forward to make this sustainable and to make it, you know, whatever it turns into next. And so if we don't have veterinarians who are interested in that, if, if it's just a bunch of, you know, veterinarians who only want to, you know, basically be in the service industry and just like, oh, I, I don't need to make any money whatsoever and I don't have to worry about any business decision, then what's going to happen is that all of those decisions will end up being made by businesses like the corporations and right. things like that. Somebody's going to make them. Somebody's going to make money off of the industry. Like, why shouldn't it be the veterinarians? Like, we're the ones who are right. passionate about it. We're the ones who are like on the ground who love it and who are making our lives it, like why shouldn't we be involved in the monetary aspect as well? Right, right, exactly. 
Yeah, but I, I understand it. I mean, I will say that for me, it's really difficult because I come into these hospitals, right? And I'm charging a wage and it's like that hospital is paying me directly. Like I can change my wage and they could pay me right. less, right? And right. there's a lot right. of guilt that's associated with that. And I could imagine that something's very similar if you're an associate and you're working in a small practice, like asking for a wage increase, like you probably feel right. pretty guilty about that. But I agree. I think that we have to kind of, you know, put it into perspective. And it's like, we're not trying to gouge anybody. We're not trying to gouge the the pet owner population and hold, you know, rabies vaccines ransom or, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's okay to kind of, you know, make, make some money and be comfortable. And that, that then allows you to want to keep showing up and doing the work. That way there's always a veterinarian there. Right. Right. And you have to think about too, like what motivates you, you know, yeah. some people money doesn't motivate them and that's obviously fine. Great. Mm -hmm. um, but for some people it's a big motivator and not just, I mean, because money motivates me, not because of like, I, I want to get rich and like have an extravagant lifestyle. It's just a, it's like a, a physical, tangible metric and reward that I can see from the fruits of my labor. Right. And not, it's not the only thing that motivates me, but it's sure. like, oh, we did this in business this month. That's a pretty cool thing because we, you know, we we increased our volume or we became more efficient, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and that's okay, I, I, I think. Um, yeah. But uh, and I think people know, like, if they're asking for more money or they're charging more um, because they can to the point of like not gouging, but uh, you know, people will pay for it. You know, we don't really need the more, need, need more. There's no justification. We just do it. Right. I think it eventually comes back to bite them in the butt. But um, uh, another thing that made, you made me think about too is um, especially talking with new graduates and just talking with one that, and hired one and learning what people are, uh, new graduates are receiving in terms of compensation, which is vastly different even from when I graduated two years after you. Yeah. Um, um, you have to think about it too. I'm talking more to you know, the, the, the new graduate, even the associate perspective is that, yeah, you could be getting, you know, now people are getting, you know, $50,000, six figure signing bonuses, and, right. you know, huge, huge salaries and, um, you know, all this stuff. You got to think, you got to ask, like, why are they doing that? Um, <laughs> what strings are attached? Yeah. Why do they have to offer that to hire somebody? Yeah. You can take that the same argument for, as a as a, a, a client, a, a pet owner going to a new clinic. Oh, well, they my last clinic charged fifty dollars for an exam. This one's charging eighty dollars. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. And why was the other one charging fifty? I would have to imagine. Or I would make the assumption that if I'm paying 80 bucks for a exam fee versus 50, I'm getting something more for that. Whether that was one on one time with a doctor or a better facility or convenience factor for whatever things are. But, um, you know, I think you get what you pay for and you get what you get what you get paid for, for you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I think um, that the benefit of what we're seeing in terms of all of these, like the increased wages and the signing bonuses and things, it, it's a signal that you don't have to necessarily take the first gig that is offered to you. Like I remember when I graduated, there was this idea that you're never going to get a job. Like when we first started school, I guess that would have been what, 2013 or something. They were like, there's not enough jobs out there. You're never going to get a job. You might as well just, right. just get the first one that you're offered. And so right. I think that that's maybe how we kind of all approached it. And so you end up in these jobs that are willing to take you. Whereas, right. you know, what is always better is to figure out, is this the right fit for, right. you know, from a culture right. perspective, from a, you know, days off perspective, from a, just the, the jive of medicine or whatever it is, you know, that, that way we, we at least have an opportunity to maybe find a better fit early on, which hopefully will go a long way to maybe not burning us out as quickly. Like if we can find the right. place where we actually enjoy working, maybe we can kind of be okay for a little while, <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I'd love to see like, you know, first job, you know, to last more than a year. I think I think that's the average. Yeah. Is that, uh, yeah, first one you're out in a year. Um, and I think getting experience in multiple practices is great, which is kind of why I envy you of seeing all these different styles and facilities. Um, uh, but I mean, how cool would it be to have, you know, really find a really great place to, 
to work right out of school and you know be there for several years until you're going to go on to you know be the head vet some other clinic or start your own practice or you know yeah. whatever so yeah. um but yeah t- times have changed <laughs> <laughs> they sure have uh, i love it yeah yeah i think it's a really interesting place to be i'm excited about what happens next i'm very curious about it too yeah it's an exciting put it this way everything we've talked about you know the culture of vet med the the patients the staff wages the tech the medicine it's all i think it's all exciting it's a good time to be in this industry and um a lot of changes but i think they're all good changes i think it's um you know, not to toot my horn, but I'm glad that I took this risk to create what we did at, at MetroVet. Um, cause I, I didn't know it was going to, I wasn't certain it was going to work. I knew I, I thought it was, um, but it's, it's taking the risks like I took that are going to hopefully start dominoing other people to do similar things so we can kind of keep moving vet med into the direction it's going. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I'm excited. Yeah. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. Hard work, but it, it, it's, uh, it's fun. Let's put it that way. Like I've been making that decision to, to leave the music industry and that, that business side, I've never looked back. Um, so it's, it's fun. Awesome, man. I, I appreciate you, uh, spending the time and staying up so late to, to talk to me. No, this is fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, and hey, if I never made a decision to go to vet school, you and I wouldn't have met. I mean, That's true. And we we have all these ideas, and we just got to do them. So yeah. Uh, we well, we're them. doing them now. I mean, truly, That's right. Both of us are. Yeah, so literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's cool, an exciting man. time. Thanks again. All right. Well, no, thanks for having me on. It's been, oh, it was fun. Of course, good. It was great. Right, bye. And that was my conversation with Seth Williams. One of the things that I find most intriguing um, in this conversation is this idea of trying to do something differently or trying to do things differently. And he talked a little bit about what that looks like for him, right? The the culture changes, but then also this sort of transparency model. In, in his clinic, it's literally a window uh, between the sort of outside, not even reception area, but the kind of lounging area um, and the treatment area. And that's something that I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's, it's intriguing to me, th- this idea, in part because we are so resistant to it. Um, I find that we, you know, people are in general resistant to change and, and things that uh, make them uncomfortable. And, and, you know, but you hear a lot, oh, I don't know if I could work in an environment like that. And in fact, if you, when you heard Seth talking about, they'd be like, oh, if you responded, oh my God, I, I couldn't possibly be in an environment like that, being watched all the time, ugh, it just makes me so uncomfortable. Maybe that's something to look into. I, I find that in general, the things that we are very resistant towards probably are telling us something. And the question to me is why we are resistant. I mean, sure, there's this idea that maybe the the clients couldn't handle it. And yes, a lot of the things that um, we do for someone who is not in the medical field, they just don't quite understand. So sure, I mean, I think that that absolutely is possible. It seems like we're resistant because we're afraid of the scrutiny. Not that we're making mistakes and, you know, we're practicing bad medicine and we don't want people to see it. It might be that maybe we're going to make more mistakes if someone's watching us. Or maybe what we're doing may be perceived as bad medicine to those who don't believe or understand what medicine is. Maybe we're afraid that we're not good enough to be watched. I think whatever it is, it does at least require some thought. Maybe it comes down to it and you say, you know what, they're going to be in the way and uh, it's going to interrupt flow and interrupt medicine and decrease my ability to provide good medicine and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, I can challenge those things all day long. Um, Or, you know, I mean, maybe you're right. Who knows? But that's not actually the point. I think that most of the time we're resistant because of something else. And I think that, you know, outside of this transparency thing, it's probably just good information in general. 
if we're afraid to do something, if we are strongly opinionated against some new idea, perhaps it's a good idea to just take a second and think about why we are feeling how we're feeling and then started to address those things. And I will say that for me, like I said, I, I, I've been resistant to it in the past. And I'm like, I don't know if I could do, you know, emergency work with people staring at me the whole time. For me, I know that it's that, that I know that I'm not going to be on my game 100% of the time. I, I know that medicine is fallible and it's easier to sort of stucco in the cracks uh, sort of after the fact than it is to create that sort of perfect facade at the beginning. But as I've realized over time is that it's okay for there to be cracks. I think that if we show people all of it, then they understand more about what medicine actually is, that it is imperfect, that we are sort of searching for something that is most of the time elusive and trusting people to be okay with that. I think that if we can educate along the way and also if we are, you know, keeping them along for the ride and, um, giving them the opportunity to see how much we do actually know that most of the time it's going to be okay. Um, most of the time, actually, it's appreciated and it gives you a better starting point to have that communication. As you may have guessed, not all of that is about should we have people watching us treat animals and do diagnostics and, you know, into the nitty gritty of the medicine that we do. That's not what this is about. I just think that it's just one of these examples of things that we end up being resistant to. Um, and it's sort of more exposing some fear than it is exposing some flawed suggestion. So it's just an opportunity to maybe maybe change it up a little bit. Maybe, maybe challenge yourself. Because at the end of the day, if we're resistant to everything that's new, we're never going to grow. Maybe that's obvious. Maybe that's something that doesn't really need to be said. Um, but I do find, you know, in myself, that's what I've noticed the most of. If I'm immediately sort of shutting down and saying, no, I could never, eh, that probably means that there's an area of growth there that I should probably engage in. And these have been the midnight stylings or 4 a.m. stylings of Matashudo. And this is what happens when you have a little bit of a lull between uh, cases and you've also previously recorded basically nonsense to be your intro and I, outro. Uh, you get some 4 a.m. stylings. That's it. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I really enjoyed talking to Seth. Uh, he's he's great. And if you haven't checked out um, the Vet School Unleashed, dissecting the DVM, it's a it's a good listen. So Seth, thank you again for being on the podcast with me. I I did beg. I, he said that his son was basically jamming out top forty hits on the xylophone on that little um, you know play right or whatever. I'm like, if you get a recording of it. I'll make it my intro music for this episode. Uh, but, he, you know, he didn't. So that's all of our loss. But that's okay, because once I get my own Fisher Price xylophone, which I absolutely am going to do, then I'll just create my own stylings. I can do it. I can make a top 40 hit on a children's instrument. Watch, watch, watch and learn. Anyway, thank you again for listening. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate your support and you listening every week. Um, and then until next time, may your discharges print on the doctor's office printer instead of, you know, the label maker. <laughs>